Welcome to our second talk of the day. I hope you're having a great time here. I love it when AstroCon's in Orlando, so I'm really happy. At the end of uh, today's talk here, if you could go to astrocon2018.sked.com, we'd really appreciate your feedback. It helps us improve, as well as give our speakers the recognition they deserve. So without further ado, we have Francisco Valentin with CERN, and he's going to be uh, captivating you today with tales of VoIP. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, Fred already introduced me. I'm Francisco Valentin. I work for CERN. And today, <clears throat> I'm going to explain how we are moving CERN's telephone infrastructure to asterisk. I have added also and friends because we use other open source projects as well as you will see in the coming slides. Um, I'm from Valladolid, Spain. I'm working for CERN since 2013. And previously, I was involved in different roles uh, for migrating TDM switches to VoIP-based vendor systems, like in Huawei with Telefonica and Vodafone, all in Europe. Um, so can you raise your hand if you know what CERN is? OK, quite good. I have a nice video to show. Uh, I promise it won't be long. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. We are based in Geneva, Switzerland. And yeah, what you see here, let me stop this for a second, is the, our most famous installation, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it has 27 kilometers of circumference. That's around 17 miles, I think. It's all underground. And what you see down there is Geneva's airport for scale. We have a huge campus, all those small dots around the LHC and that big part uh, next to Atlas, that's uh, our main campuses. Um, so we have many, many phones spread around all these areas. And the four main experiments that are listed there, they are general detectors for uh, different kinds of particle collisions. So you have CMS, ALICE, Atlas, and LHCV. Um, so CERN's main business is particle physics, not telephony, unfortunately. Um, and everything begins here with an hydrogen bottle. What we have in hydrogen atom is an electron and a proton. So we will strip the protons away, and we will launch them into the first phase, which is the linear accelerators and uh, sequence of accelerators that will make the protons be grouped in bunches, and these bunches will reach uh, close to the speed of light. So what you see here, they, they all have really fancy names. Um, yeah. So they are getting now into the outer circle. This is the previous stage prior to the LHC. And here, we have these two bunches of protons traveling the LHC in opposite directions. So what we will have is obviously collisions. This is what the LHC looks like, 27 kilometers just like that. And when these bunches reach one of the detectors, they will make these highly energetic collisions uh, that will let us learn something about physics. So uh, we, we have lots of collisions. We have one every 25 nanoseconds. And this generates a huge amount of data. Um, most of the collisions, they are not interesting from the physics perspective because they, they are known phenomena. So we kind of discard them. We have this first trigger level that will discard those collisions that are not interesting. Um, those that are kind of promising are transferred to our central data center, which is receiving this incredible amount of data. And what we are doing here is we are uh, keeping a local copy. We are doing an initial data reconstruction as well. And then we are copying these to our tape robots that will store it forever or <laughs> long term. And the rest of the data is distributed to our worldwide computing grid. 
So those main two dots in Europe, that's Geneva and Budapest, where we have our secondary data center. But then we have agreements with many research centers around the globe, and we transmit this data real time so it gets analyzed. And a collision looks something like this in the end. It's just like a 3D picture of what the trajectories of the product of the collisions uh, were and what the, were the directions. Um, in the end, what we do is we generate uh, collisions with really high frequency. We accumulate this data. And then our scientists apply machine learning technologies to detect what's the signal and what's the noise. And that little bump over there, that's how the Higgs boson was detected. This confirms Sir Peter Higgs' theory, which led him to win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2013. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, if you want to visit CERN next year in September, there will be open days. It doesn't happen really often because it's a really radioactive environment and it's at almost zero Kelvin, so really cold. But uh, next September, if you're around Geneva, feel free to come and we will have a weekend of open days. And, and now to the main subject of today's presentation is what's our journey to make evolve the telephone infrastructure at CERN to something based on voice over IP and open source components. So we have it, we had this need to evolve and we ask ourselves some questions that I'm going to explain later. We started that search phase. We defined an architecture that I'm gonna show and then I'm going to explain what's our current status and future developments. Um, yeah, we were running this legacy PBX since the 90s. Uh, maybe you can identify the vendor from the pictures. Uh, it's this traditional monolithic design. The hardware is aging poorly. We've seen how these cards are failing every day. The cable infrastructure as well, we've had many, many issues with that. And sometimes we cannot just replace the cables because they were laid out in the 60s and we don't have even plans for that. Um, the license costs are growing or at least are stable, but we cannot offer new services to our users. And we must not forget that these kind of PBXs were not designed for voice over IP. So in the end, we were, we were kind of living with a dinosaur that is not suited for what we need today. Um, to give some figures about what this PBX has, it has around 8,000 cabled phones, so these kind of analog or digital devices. Um, we have around 3,000 hardware VoIP, I'm not saying SIP, because they are from different vendors. Um, we integrate our mobile phones as well, so that's 6,000. 2,000 unified communication clients. And then one of my, well, probably the most important use case is the emergency devices. We have red phones around the LHC tunnels that are used for emergency response. And the lift, are, the elevators are also connected to our PBX. And then, well, like in many other installations, uh, we have many, many smaller use cases that we needed to tackle in order to perform the migration. Um, so in the previous architecture, the legacy PBX was at the core, at the center of, the, of everything. Uh, when I arrived to CERN, I found that we were still using ISDN trunks. Um, we had all this set of analog devices. We had the emergency devices, the red phones, that look something like this. Actually, we got them from a museum. They, they don't have any electronics, because otherwise the ionizing radiation will melt them. So they are really basic, and yeah, that's, that's probably the most critical use case. Um, there, there was some advance in trying to integrate video conferencing and Skype for Business into it through gateways, of course. And then we had this agreement with our mobile operator to send us some calls through ISDN trunks. In addition to that, we were using some of these legacy PBX advanced telephony services, which, was, well, which were not so advanced, like switchboard, service desk, 
but the most important ones are the other two, the LHC operation call center, the number that everybody who's doing operations in the LHC needs to call to inform about the status, and the fire brigade call center that is called whenever you go off hook on one of the red phones. And then we had some kind of homebrewed uh, business support tools like AAA, mass provisioning, and we were even able to feed some list cost routing uh, into this monster. So well, it kind of worked. And then we, we had basic SNMP monitoring, so this was integrated into our operation and monitoring tools, so um, we could have some basic alarms on the status. Um, coming back to this, we, we have 40,000 DIDs uh, for all our landlines, mobiles, unified communications. They all belong in a single unified dial plan. So that's, yeah, when they told me there was a PBX, I thought it was going to be something smaller when I joined CERN, but... <laughs> Um, as you saw in the previous slides, all of the integrations were done either through gateways, custom developments made by the provider of the PBX, or by ISDN trunks. And it was really critical for the operation of the LHC and therefore and for all the operations of the fire and safety unit. So, well, what you see here is the CERN uh, original switchboard in the 60s. We have all this set of all nice pictures of technology. Um, we ask ourselves the big question, which is indeed several. Can we replace this PBX by something that is future-proof, that uses open protocols and standards, so we can make it interoperable and be more flexible? Um, can we, while we achieve those objectives, reduce or totally remove the license cost? And for that, can we re reuse open source components that are there in the market? And can we do that on top of our existing IT infrastructure? And of course, can we do that with our current skills? Because we, we have a really small telephony team. We are around four people. So we needed to achieve all this, gain the skills, and reuse existing technologies just to make it work. And then, um, more importantly, it's not only about migrating it, it's about operating it. So um, once we manage to migrate it, will we be able to operate it with the same level, if not higher, of reliability? As you saw, we, we have all these critical systems there, and we need to offer SLAs to our colleagues, so we, we need to, to run it uh, at least at the same level of the old PBX. With computer security, so if somehow we integrate these open source solutions but they are easily hacked, that will be really bad for CERN's reputation. And agility, can, can we expect from the new architecture that we will be able to introduce new services easier? So we started our search, and I really like this picture that it's, it comes from the CERN press office because you have this piece of high tech, and on the wall, on your right, you can see, actually it's on your left, sorry. Uh, you can see the little red phone hanging over there. It's that thing over there. So we, we started looking at what was on the market, on the open source market. Um, what were the communications projects that were out there, and we were, looking for established solutions, things that were used by big communities that had continuous release cycles, so they are always tackling these computing security issues, these improvements, these uh, new protocols, WebRTC stuff. Um, we were interested in knowing if there was paid technical support, even if initially we're not using it, but maybe someday CERN will need that. And we were not looking at niche solutions or monopolies because we want to make sure that if one of these open source projects goes the wrong way, uh, we will be able to replace it with something similar with some minor effort. Um, so we started this project internally, we call it TONE, which stands for Telephony Open Source Network Evolution. And the main milestones that we, we have achieved 
is that we launched this project late 2014. We, we were testing many, many different alternatives. In 2015, we came up with a draft of what the architecture would look like. And this was the most important step, probably. We managed to convince the CERN's directorate to give us the green light. So we moved forward with this. In 2016, we had a major contract change for our mobile telephony. So we took advantage of that to integrate that into our infrastructure. Uh, last year, we did the same thing with all landline telephony. And we managed to replace this switchboard that had been operating for, I don't know, 50 years or so. Uh, by an automated switchboard, uh, which is an asterisk application. And this year we are still finishing some migration to SIP pranks for which is inbound and outbound calls. Um, well, so this is what the architecture looks like. Um, we wanted to make it endpoint agnostic, so you can access it today with any client from unified communications to mobile telephony, also traditional landlines are still there. And I, I said that we are using Asterisk and Friends because we have their Camellio as a front end. Um, it's just yeah, receiving all these calls from different subdomains and then uh, making sure that it reaches this core element, which is our Asterisk. We name that internally application routing engine. And what it does is that it stores all the user rights, all the dial plan, all the special services. Um, would you see that all of them, they are clusterized, so we can scale them independently. And then um, if the call somehow needs to leave CERN, we have implemented the least cost routing functionality as came in Camellio as well, as a different function. And there we have our SIP trunks to external operators. <clears throat> in order to operate and maintain the clusters and do incident response, we really found Brandec to be super useful to schedule maintenances or whatever. And then, um, of course, we, we use Homer. All the nodes are just throwing there all the traffic so we can have some, yeah, some monitoring server. And then we have implemented a long-term backup to Elasticsearch. So for mobile phones, um, what we have is that all our mobile phones belong to the Swiss numbering plan, so they belong to a Swiss operator. Uh, well, I don't know if you can see that clearly, but there's a red dotted line. So one particularity of CERN is that we are between two countries, and that makes everything super complicated in terms of roaming. Um, we are the, the southern part, that's Switzerland, northern, that's France. So um, we have built these two points of presence for our infrastructure. One is Meran and the other one is Prevesan, Switzerland and France. And basically we have this agreement with our operator that whenever there's a mobile to mobile call, it's managed by them inside the mobile VPN. But whenever they try to dial an external number, we want to be in control. So they delegate us the call that is reaching asterisk. And then we have an agreement with a French operator that whenever the users are roaming in the French area, we have the same behavior. Everything which is mobile to mobile is managed by the operators. But whenever there's these outbound calls, they reach our infrastructure. And here, Asterisk is managing the calling rights. It's playing an IVR, asking for some credentials. And then it's creating the billing records. And then we propagate internally to the correct department for rebilling. Um, I said that we wanted to reuse our agile infrastructure. Um, this is basically something that is run in our same IT department. It's, uh, an open, it's based on OpenStack VMs running CentOS 7 in most cases. Everything is managed by Puppet. And all the nodes are reporting to the agile monitoring infrastructure, which is showing all these in uh, Kibana, Grafana, nice dashboards. Um, orchestration is done today through network configuration tools that we have used traditionally for uh, configuring everything, which is switches, routers, and probably in the future it will be based also in the OpenStack or Puppet world. Um, so I said in the beginning in the video that we have two data centers. What you see on the left is Geneva, on the right Budapest. There are many countries between them, but we have these three contracts for three direct 
high speed links between them. And that means that if there's a major outage at CERN in Geneva, we are able to run our, all our services in, from Budapest. Um, there's been some business continuity exercises that have proven that that works. So that's good news. And we needed to propagate our infrastructure there as well. But in our case, given that we are providing these critical services for the fire brigade, for the red phones, etc., it means that even if we have five different availability zones in the OpenStack projects in uh, Geneva and Budapest, that's not enough because the, the, the CLAs that they provide is, is really short for our needs. So we needed to build our own points of presence. That means buying the racks, installing the servers, pulling the fibers, etc. They are based on bare metal, but we still manage those with Puppet as well. So we use the same manifest for virtual and bare metal servers. Uh, it's sustained by long duration batteries. They all belong to the same dedicated subnet, which is isolated from the rest of the network. We have direct fiber paths between both sides. And then we, when we did the migration to ship trunks, uh, we got all the points of presence for the operators also in the same rack. So everything is managed by batteries. And in the case of a major outage, we will always have at least the fire brigade system, the inbound and outbound calls that should work. And one important thing about our, our architecture is that we are not virtualizing the same thing as this is an asterisk, this is a camellia that performs this, the whole thing. We are trying to virtualize functions and basically um, we do this as self-contained systems, so they all come along with their own database with all the call routing logic and configuration. And the, we, all, we will always have this critical capacity in the bare metal server. So if somehow the data centers go offline, we, we manage to survive. Um, the, the, the good thing about this using functions is that we can scale them independently. So if we need more capacity for the breakout, we will just scale those nodes. At the same point, it uh, minimizes the endpoints and AORs tables in asterisk. The Camellia configuration files get simpler. And we can have things as different branches. So we have the dev branch, the QA and master. So we can really uh, have this life cycle and propagate changes progressively. So if we mess up, we can always roll back to the previous branch. And all in all, it makes things really easier to maintain or to troubleshoot. And what I would say in earlier is that we have these projects. We, we use namely these three asterisk, Chameleon and Homer. Asterisk gets used in different functions. We have the application routing engine, but we use it uh, isolated for landlines or for mobiles or for the new automated switchboard that we operated, that we migrated last year. Camellio lives as a front end, that's a breakout, and now we are also using it as a WebRTC proxy. And Homer, well, it's just a one-to-one -one matching between project and, and function. I, I would also like to highlight when, that whenever you want to roll out a new architecture in a place like CERN, you need to define new policies that go along and you need to get those policies uh, approved by anyone. So uh, believe it or not, in 2018, we needed to get an agreement that analog lines would disappear. They will be only used for emergency phones that we will not be placing uh, analog telephony gateways everywhere. Um, we are also trying to remove all hardware phones where they are not really needed. And now our priority is to have a WebRTC portal. Um, and this links to the next topic, which is the future developments. So we still have all the analog telephone or most of them still connected to the legacy PVX which is just a gateway to our new infrastructure. Um, for removing all these analog phones, we need to have this WebRT, WebRTC portal ready. But we are kind of struggling with the implementation because we were aiming at having a single uh, code base for all kind of devices. So we started working on a wrapper around ZipJS. And then we discovered that if we want to integrate that with React Native, that's not compatible at all. So we are now trying to aim to an alternative which uses Janus as a gateway, um, but we are still in a really initial phase on that. And then um, 
the main development that's there to follow is the advanced telephony services. We need to migrate the call centers, especially the LHC operations and the fire brigade. We have been gathering requirements from the owners of these services at CERN. Um, we are convinced that they don't really need a, a long list of fancy features. It's just basic call centers. Um, but here we will focus on red the redundancy. We need to propagate this on the clusters, make it highly available, um, yeah, and make it work from the red phone to the call center and, and make sure that it works all the time. That was all. Thank you.